Hello everyone, this video is like a brief overview then of the final geography paper, which is paper three. Paper three, you would answer all of the questions on this exam, and it's sort of split really into three sections. The first section you'll see when you open paper three is your issue evaluation. This year, the issue evaluation is all on the Amy Water Beach, thinking about whether the waste incinerator should be built and what the benefits are for that. I've done a separate video that talks you through everything you need to know about the issue evaluation, sort of my key thoughts about the issue evaluation this year and what possibly I think the questions may well be. I'll pop a link to that one either at the top of this video or down below. The second sort of section of this paper is all about unfamiliar field work and the whole purpose of this is to get you to apply some of the geographical skills you've learned to field work examples to think about what are the benefits of these bits of field work what are the drawbacks and actually how can you draw reliable conclusions and what perhaps you might do next time. Think of the fieldwork section almost as like a science experiment where you set out your methods really clearly, you've got to evaluate, you've got to be able to draw conclusions and you've got to be able to reflect on it. And then last but not least is the geographical skills section. Here you'll be asked to sort of weigh up some pros and cons of different types of data presentation you might also be asked to complete some graphs and some sort of basic stats tests. Having a calculator for this paper will come massively in hand. And I think, to be honest, it will save you a heck of a lot of time. So if we start with the unfamiliar field work, because as I said, the issue evaluation, I've done a separate video on that. So there's no point going over old ground. I suppose the key things you need to know about the unfamiliar field work section are what these key terms mean. These are the terms that they will use in the questions, so it's important that you understand them. So if I'm thinking about an inquiry question, ultimately this is my title, this is what I'm trying to answer by carrying out all of the fieldwork techniques. The data collection methods are obviously the way that I'm going to collect my data. Presentation is then how I'm going to show that data, so it could be graphs, maps, etc. An accurate conclusion, this is the one that normally trips people up. Again, I'll draw your attention to that one. So this is when data is collected in the correct way. So it's got to be trustworthy. It can't be ambiguous. Okay. What I mean by that is I can't have three bits of data and say, yep, that's an accurate conclusion. I can definitely prove that that's happened over three bits of data. So data's got to be overwhelmingly in favour. A reliable conclusion then sort of leads nicely on to that. So in order for the conclusion to be both accurate and reliable, I've got to have enough data collected so I can trust the result that's been drawn. So here are just some examples then of fieldwork questions that you might see in unfamiliar fieldwork. So sometimes in the unfamiliar fieldwork section, they'll give you a question and perhaps say, well, what data would you collect to try and prove or disprove this question? How would you present data for this inquiry? And you can see here the questions are pretty varied. So for physical fieldwork questions, might be looking at river characteristics, might be thinking about longshore drift, perhaps thinking about flood management. Likewise for human, thinking about how successful a regeneration project has been or what the environmental quality is like between two areas. And so all good fieldwork starts with a risk assessment. And again, you might be asked and given a fieldwork title to, 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 to suggest couple of risks then that come with that. So think really carefully about what you can do to mitigate risks, so are you make the impacts of that less. You might be asked again to suggest one or more risks to two fieldwork inquiries. So if we go back to some of the fieldwork titles I suggested before, thinking about rivers, well perhaps river currents would be one thing that I may well choose to risk assess. Perhaps the risk of slipping over uneven ground Thinking about human geography titles, well, unfamiliar areas, the potential for getting lost, stranger danger perhaps is an obvious one, traffic and crossing roads. So here, if you look at my table that I've drawn on the screen, this first column here is explaining the risk. This second column here is now how I can mitigate. Okay, remember I said mitigate was to lower the risk. So if I take the traffic example, well, getting run over by vehicles on a busy road, that's my risk. But to mitigate that, I need to lower the risk. I might say, right, well, I'm only going to cross using the pedestrian crossings, for example. 
So types of data then that I might want to collect and rest of them might ask you to suggest a type here. If I think about my physical geography titles to begin with, and I take that rivers example, primary data as a reminder is data that I set about collecting myself. Secondary data then would be data collected by somebody else, but I can still use that. So if I think about data I can collect myself, perhaps for a river's title, I might be interested in the depth of the river, I might be interested in the speed of the river. And then secondary data that I could perhaps borrow from somebody else would be like the OS maps, so I can check the relief of the area, or I might borrow the erosion rates from somebody else. And I can apply exactly the same thing then to a human title. So for human titles, I might think about, right, I'm interested in tourism on an area. I might look at doing an environmental quality survey. I might do a traffic count, a pedestrian count. Those are all things I can do myself. And then data that I borrow, so my secondary data, might be things like census data. I might get the crime statistics. I might look at house prices. And it's important when you're doing field work that you have a balance of both primary and secondary data. And if we link that back to the keywords we looked at at the start, that's going to help me to draw an accurate and reliable conclusion because it's data that isn't just collected by me. Then, if I think about sampling strategies, the way I collect this data, again, should be roughly in line with each of these three. So I can do something that's called random sampling. If I'm doing random sampling, I'm sort of selecting sites without really an agenda to it. Okay, I'm just plotting them anywhere I feel like it. This has some advantages, but also disadvantages. And you might be asked to weigh these up in the exam also. So an advantage of doing random sampling, so I might say, right, there's not really bias because each site has an equal chance of being picked. I could do this pretty quickly. It's pretty easy to do. But the disadvantage of this means sometimes it's not representative. It might also lead then to sites that are inaccessible. If I don't know the area well, I'm just randomly picking these places. I don't know where I've chosen till I get there. Systematic sampling will be picking sites every so many metres. So if I was doing a walk perhaps from school into town, I might say every 250 metres I'm going to stop and collect my data. So it's nice and spread out. So the advantage of this would give me good representation of the area. Perhaps it's easier to do the random sampling because I'm just following that set measurement. Disadvantages are it's quite time consuming, can be some bias because not equal sites have been chosen. Again, I could get some sites that are still inaccessible. I don't know until the day. Stratified sampling then means picking sites by topic. OK, so this one's quite good because it's flexible and allows you to get a comparison of different areas. For example, if I was doing my rivers, I might be thinking, right, I'm going to pick two sites in the upper course, two in the middle course, and two in the lower course. That would be stratified sampling. I wouldn't use this for things like a questionnaire. Okay, and I also would suggest that it does bring in some bias. Okay, the person that's picking the sites is ultimately responsible, aren't they, for where they're choosing that data. So there might be a tendency perhaps to pick the sites where it's easiest, for example. So I think then about how I'm going to improve data collection methods, I've got to keep it accurate and reliable, but also make it representative. So to be accurate and reliable, I've got to collect a lot of data. I've got to ask a wide variety of questions, especially if I'm doing a questionnaire. If something's opinion based, I've got to try and consult with other people to reduce bias. And collect data then perhaps at different days, years, different weather conditions, if I'm going to make this even more accurate. To be representative, I've got to collect data at more sites. I've got to ask lots of people for their opinion. And again, I could collect data at different times, years. Okay, if I'm trying to prove that there's been a change, I can't really draw an accurate, reliable conclusion off of one hour's worth of work. I'm going to have to go back over a period of time. So if we link this into geographical skills then, the final section of paper three, and I said you're going to be asked to weigh up the sort of benefits and the negatives of using different presentation techniques but also to complete some of these so I suppose the thing to check as we do this next section is do you understand what each of these methods are can you do one positive one negative of each and if worse comes to worst could you plot some of this data if you are asked to so let's start then with sort of the statistics 
So again, just check now. Do you understand what mean, median, mode, range and interquartile range are? This sounds really obvious and really simple, but every year they ask students to complete these and you'll be surprised the amount of people that don't understand the difference between mode and mean. So again, just check. Mode is obviously the most common. Mean is when I would add them all up and divide by how many there are. I suppose now it would be a good time just to check what are the sort of benefits and negatives using these techniques. And I would suggest there are lots of positives to doing this. Okay, Averages might remove the risk of anomalies. It's easy to see the trends. You can compare between areas. It provides quite a lot of quantitative data. Okay, If you've got a sort of project that's mostly focused around qualitative, having some quantitative, i.e. numerical data, perhaps gives you something different to analyse. So if we move straight onto the maps then and the graphs, a chloroperth map is the one here that you can see at the top. This uses different shades of colour or symbols to display different amounts. Again, you might be asked just to shade in one bit of a map in the exam. What's the advantage of this? Well, we can spot trends pretty easily, but the disadvantage is it doesn't show me total values. I've got some quite big gaps. If I look at the key, perhaps this data will go up in 50s. Well, where on that scale am I? I can't really tell using this. An isoline map uses lines that join up values of the same. So think contour lines, for example, perhaps your best sort of example of this one. Advantages are, lets me compare areas of equal values. Again, it's quite difficult to read if the lines are close together would be the drawback of this technique. Dot maps and proportional symbols then. Dot maps show one dot per value. So proportional symbols are typically circles that are drawn at different sizes. So this map here on the right shows you that. The big advantage here is it's quite easy to interpret. The disadvantage means that clustering makes them hard to read. If you sort of have a look over here, you can see some of these dots are overlapping together. And the issue is that I can't pinpoint or read off that data accurately. Flow lines and desire lines. It's important you understand the difference here. Flow lines are showing movement of something from one place to another. So this graph here on the left shows us that. Desire lines show us how places are connected i.e. you might use this to show people travelling where, or where they're travelling from to one destination. That's what this map here is showing you on the right. Advantages are, shows you connections between places, but again, a bit like we talked about previously with proportional symbols, overlapping makes it quite hard to read. Bar charts and histograms. Again, I've labelled on the difference between these two here, but bar charts are showing continuous data, Again, you've got histograms. Look at the difference between the two. So you can see with my bar chart, my bars are nice and spaced out. The histogram are obviously touching. Advantages gives me a clear comparison or trend. Disadvantages are then doesn't really show me the causes of these trends at all. The line graph then shows me this change over time. It says there is always a dependent, okay, an independent variable in order for this to work i.e. think about the number of cars that are on the road. So again, what's pretty good about a line graph? Well, I can show multiple sets of data, but if I put too much data on that graph, it makes it particularly hard to read. Dispersion graphs, this is a common one to ask you to plot this in the exam. Just takes a different set of data, basically allows you to spread it out, and then you can see if there's any data that's grouped or clustered together. So for example, on this one here, we can see that the pebble size seems to be grouped around five centimetres. Again, pretty good because you can spot an anomaly. Disadvantage here, it's quite time consuming to analyse and to plot. Scatter graphs, I would only use a scatter graph if I'm interested in that link between two sets of data. So if I'm trying to prove that the deeper the river, the higher the velocity, a scatter graph would be quite useful here. If I'm trying to plot data perhaps of a pedestrian count, a scatter graph wouldn't be very useful at all. Advantages here then is I can draw that line of best fit, so I can try and prove there is a correlation. Disadvantage here is that analysis of that correlation is very subjective, okay? And that's going to differ from person to person, so it doesn't always provide the most accurate or the most reliable conclusion. And last but not least then are the final three graphs you can see here. So the divided by chart again shows us them where this information is subdivided. Perhaps I would use this for a questionnaire. 
and I would say, right, how many people agree or disagree, and here are the results. So again, I can see that trend quite easily, but it does require quite a lot of additional explanation. You effectively got to have a key in order to make that data there have any sort of meaning. A pictogram is just representing things using a symbol. So perhaps if I was trying to do a little graph or a survey of how people got to school, a pictogram would be quite useful. So the big advantages are here that it's easy to interpret, but perhaps not suitable for continuous data. And finally then, that pie chart is your divided circle that represents a quantity. Again, this is pretty good if I want to display parts of a whole. Disadvantages are here. I wouldn't really use this to try and prove or to try and show a trend at all. It wouldn't be the most effective choice. So as I said at the start of this section, check now that you can explain each technique. You can do an advantage, a disadvantage for each one. And should worse come to worse in the exam, you'd be able to plot each of these ones if you needed to. So that's everything there is for paper three. As I said, I will link the issue evaluation video to this as well. And the very best of luck.